So for those of you who were scared to go throwing axes, I don't know, I guess Paul made it sound like we were going to throw them at each other. Um, that's not the case. Uh, we had a wonderful time. You guys missed out on an amazing time. And uh, there are some pictures of us actually throwing axes here. There you go. So you can see no one is throwing axes at each other. It's all supervised. And we had a wonderful time. So we plan these outings. We plan them so that you guys, we can get together and get to know one another and bond with one another. That's what they're for. Um, so hopefully next time we do something like this, we'd like to have a little bigger turnout, get some more of our brothers and sisters out to it. Amen? Amen. All right. Galatians chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 1. I find that's always the best place to start when you're starting a chapter. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Lord, we just lift this word up to you this morning. We pray, Lord, um, for your, that you would meet us where we're at here today. Everyone's here, Lord, in a different place. Everyone's here struggling, dealing with something. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word, as your word is alive. Lord, we pray for, for Sonia, Lord. We pray as she's uh, in the last stages of her life, suffering from cancer. I pray, Lord, that you would just get a hold of her heart. And Lord, that she would get to gaze upon your face. Lift up Joe, um, Joanne's uh, ex-husband, Lord. I just We just found out had a stroke and is in the hospital. We pray for him. Lord, we pray for, for your intervention there. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, intervene and, and give the family peace and comfort. We pray, Lord, for Lewis. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you brought him through his procedure and that he's here with us this morning. And, Lord, we just pray for everyone in the body who's, who's dealing with something, going through something. Lord, you are sovereign and you are in control. And, Lord, we, we just lay this at your feet and ask it in your name. Amen. So freedom is a very important part of Paul's argument, right? We've been set free. The whole idea, we've been set free. Why would we ever want to go back into slavery? And here's an important thing to remember. We do not, nor could we ever, even if we wanted to, set ourselves free. We just can't do it. Let's say you committed a crime, but instead of turning yourself in, you ran and hid, right? You're free. Right? You didn't get caught. You're in hiding. You're on the lam. But are you really free? Are you really free? No, because the penalty for the crime you committed is still going to hang over your head. You're always going to be in bondage to that crime. The only way you can truly be set free is to turn yourself in, to face the penalty for your crime. We're all guilty of sin. All of us. And the punishment for that sin, the punishment that we face, according to the Bible, is death. That's the punishment. That's the penalty. Sin keeps us in bondage. And, and the day that we stand before the Lord, we're going to face the punishment for that sin, which is eternal death and separation. So the only way that we could be set free from that death sentence is by placing our faith and our hope and our trust in Jesus Christ, who took our sin upon himself. He traded places with us. It was the worst trade deal in the history of trades ever. But that's the awesome God that we serve, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. So that we, listen, think about that for a minute. I was, I was, think, I was praying about this this morning on the way down here, and, and it, it just hit me Um you know, for many of you here, you know that I lost a son. And as much as I love you, I would never, ever, ever sacrifice my son for you, for a stranger, for, for someone I loved, for a stranger, for anybody. But God did that. Because his love is so much greater than, than anything we could ever think or imagine. He sacrificed his son for us. And, the, and, and, and think, about, think about us. Think about how disobedient we are at times. Think of how messed up we are at times 
that we still have his grace and his mercy and his love. So the worst trade in the history of trades, he traded his life for ours. So that we who are guilty would become innocent. So that he who is innocent and sinless would take our sin upon him. And he took that sin to the cross and he put it to death, fulfilling the righteous requirement of God. So that we who were sinners, our sinners, could be forgiven and washed clean by his blood. And given what we don't deserve, eternal life in heaven. The moment we were set free, the bonds, the chains of the law, sin, and death that held us captive just fell from our wrists and ankles. So Paul tells us to stand firm in that freedom, not to waver from it. We're told to hold on to our precious freedom because that freedom cost us nothing, but it cost Christ everything. Jesus died for us. That's something that we nor the law could ever do. He died to set us free so we could never set ourselves free. His sacrifice on the cross freed us from the power and penalty of our sin. His sacrifice took the sting out of death. And his sacrifice freed us from the bondage of law by fulfilling the law in us. That's the freedom we have for those who've placed our faith in Jesus Christ. But what would happen if we just decided that his sacrifice and his grace just aren't sufficient for us? It's not sufficient for our salvation. We need to do something. we got to go do something to either save ourselves or to maintain our salvation. What would happen if we decided to trade, and this would be even a worse trade than the first one, trade grace for works. And that's what Paul ha- describes next. What happens when we trade grace for works? Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision which, by the way, is a symbol, a sign of the law, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. Paul lists three things here that happens to us when when we reject grace For the law, when we trade grace for works. One, Jesus is no longer going to be an advantage to us, no longer be a profit to us, profit for us. Two, you're going to be obligated now to obey the whole law. And three, you're going to be severed, cut off, or estranged from God. Let's take a moment and look at each one of those burdens, really. The burdens of the consequence of trading grace for works. Number one, Jesus will be no advantage or profit to us. Listen, church today, many churches today, not this one, but there are many out there that are less a pen for the sheep and more a farm for the goats. (laughs) Of course, that's a reference to the sheep who belong to Jesus and the goats who do not. And what, what this pastor who I was listening to in a podcast was referring to is churches who actually have Super Bowl-themed parties. That's their Sunday. Where they do 30-second theology bites based on the commercials of the Super Bowl rather than the Word of God. Where the superstar pastor runs down the aisle high-fiving everybody who's come to see the show. Where they have a kickoff. Where they actually kick the Bible as someone holds it across the sanctuary. That's a church. Churches that have secular artists perform secular songs during what's what's supposed to be worship. The church had a pastor sitting on a wrecking ball, swinging across the stage to the song of, I guess, well, from what I understand now, doing the research, Miley Miley Cyrus wrote this song. Listen, I don't care about Miley Cyrus. I've never cared about Miley Cyrus. 
even if it was right to look at her because she was naked as she did this. So this is what you're leading people to go check out now on a video, right? Even if I could, even if it was le even if it was acceptable to look at her naked, I wouldn't do it. But it's just wrong. There, there's nothing more wrong. You can't be more wrong about this, right? And you're, you're swinging across the stage to this song, inviting people to now go check out this video. People in church. Any believing Christian that felt comfortable in that atmosphere is not a believing Christian. I'm sorry. The word church in the Greek is ekklesia, and it means the called out assembly or the called out ones. Called out of where? Where are we called out of? The world. The world. We are called out of the world. We're to be separate from the things of this world. Not axe throwing. That's, that's different. We're okay. We can go axe throwing. But when the church adopts the things of this world, it may and it, trying to make themselves more rev, more relevant, more seeker friendly, the church becomes part of the world, not separated from it, but part of it, and therefore it becomes a farm for goats. I just like saying that term. So you're going to hear it a lot today. It just it's funny to me. Anyway, I am making a point here, so just bear with me. On any given Sunday in churches, there are non-believers, right? Because church, in my opinion, well, church in the opinion of the Bible is a pen for the sheep. It's for the sheep. And the Bible tells us that in church, in the sheep pen, the, the sheep are to be edified and built up to go out and minister to the lost goats in the world, right? I should have renamed this sermon, The Goats and the Sheep, but Margaret would have killed me when she printed all the bulletins. There are times, however, when goats wander into the sheep pen, right? I was once a lost goat who wandered into the sheep pen at Calvary Chapel Old Bridge. And guess what happened? This lost goat was transformed into one of his sheep. So the church must not only be a place for the saved, it also has to be a place where the lost feel loved and welcomed, but not so comfortable that they stay lost. Goats should always be welcomed here, but not feel comfortable to remain a goat. So imagine this. Imagine you're a goat. Some of you are young goats. Some of you are old goats as I look around. <laughs> and you imagine walking into this church. Yes, Lewis, it's you. <laughs> and they're singing worship songs about drinking and having friends in low places. And then there's the pastor swinging across the stage on a wrecking ball to a Miley Cyrus song. That's your first impression of Christianity and Jesus Christ. And you're going to walk away from that experience thinking that a lost goat can remain a lost goat and just hang out on the goat farm, never becoming a sheep. There are consequences to becoming comfortable on the goat farm. And Paul is saying here that there's also consequences to going back to a works-based faith. It takes a lot of work to plan a show like that every week that's good enough to keep people coming back to see what's that crazy pastor going to do this week, right? It's a lot of work building a church like that. What does the Bible say? Those who labor themselves to build the church, they, build it, they labor in vain. Because only the Holy Spirit can build the church. What should draw people into a church is the prompting of the Holy Spirit, who's moving his sheep, by the way, into churches where they could be fed the word of God. But it's also a lot of work to either try to save yourself or to maintain your salvation through your works. So what are the consequences? First, you know that the law and your works will not save you any more than hanging out on a goat farm is going to save a lost goat. Look how I made that connection there. I know it's a stretch, but just bear with me. Second, if you're a believer and you return to the bondage of the law, you're never going to grow. You're going to remain stagnant and just consumed by your works. Just like if you're a believer in a goat farm, I, I told you I love that term. You're never going to grow. You're going to remain stagnant in your faith. 
Third, anyone who rejects grace and believes works can save them or help them maintain their salvation has made Jesus of no advantage to you. In other words, his sacrifice on the cross has been cheapened because you're saying his sacrifice wasn't sufficient for your salvation. Listen, if you never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and you believe that your good works is going to save you, you're always going to remain a goat. And as long as you're a goat, you will remain separated from the sheep who belong to the Lord. If you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you believe in a works-based salvation, that's the saddest condition of all. Because you will never have the true assurance of your salvation. You'll never know if you've done a good, enough good works in your life for the gates of heaven to just swing open and, and let you in. You're never going to experience the peace that comes from resting in Jesus' finished work on the cross. Where he did it all for us. He left nothing for us to do, by the way, other than to place our trust in him. Second, Paul says you're going to be obligated to keep the whole law. If you want a works-based faith, that that's what you want, if you want to obey the law, then you have to obey the whole law. All of it, all 613 of them. And that's where the Hebrew roots people confuse me. Because they'll tell you that you need to follow the law. You must follow the law to be saved, right? But when you ask about the sacrificial laws, no, nah, no, nah, we don't have to follow those. Jesus took care of that on a cross. Well, did he take care of just the sacrificial laws or all of them? I'm under the impression he fulfilled the whole law. A law, by the way, that Peter admits at the Jerusalem council was a burden even for them to follow. Listen to his words. He said, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we'll be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. So to say that you don't have to follow the sacrificial law is to go against what James writes. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point is guilty of it all. If you're going to follow the law, if that's what you want, then you're obligated to follow all the law, the whole law. Because God's standard is perfection. And if you fail in one part of the law, you failed in all of it. Do you see how impossible this is? If you want to follow the law, if you want a works-based faith, if that's what you want to do, if you can do enough works, then you have to be perfect in your works and perfect in your motives and perfect in your thoughts and perfect in everything you do in order for that to even be a consideration when you're standing before Jesus. It's impossible. So if you want a works-based faith, if you want to follow the law, then this is what you need to do. You need to install a kitchen in, your, in the outside of your house, an outdoor kitchen, with a grill big enough to roast cattle and roast goats on, right? You got to roast bulls and goats. That's what you need to do. And you better hope that your neighbor isn't a member of PETA. <laughs> I am a member, an offshoot of PETA, which is people for the eating of tasty animals, <laughs> which would be on your grill if you were sacrificing a bull. But what about what Jesus said? In Matthew 5, he said, it's not about outwardly keeping the law. It's about keeping the law inwardly. Jesus said, if you're angry enough to call your brother a fool, then you've committed murder. And if you look at someone with lust, you've, you're guilty of adultery. The point is, how can we keep the law perfectly and, and expect it to protect us outwardly if we're breaking it inwardly? You can't. It's impossible. In order to do that, in order to, to obey the law perfectly, inwardly and outwardly, you'd have to rely on your flesh. How's that work out for you? Has your flesh let you down recently? We can't follow the law perfectly, which means eventually you're going to break one of them that you've already committed to obey. And if you broke one, you broke them all. So you've already failed. So your life is going to be a constant sequence of failure. Third, you'll be severed, cut off, or strained from Jesus. So this has two meanings. If, if, you've, if you have not placed your trust in Jesus Christ and you believe the law can save you, remember, 
God's standard is perfection, right? And so you need to perfectly follow the law. But by God's grace, he sent his son to perfectly fulfill the law for us. And if you decide to go the route of the law, Paul says we've separated ourselves from the grace of God. And if you're saved and you're rejecting grace for works, and you're rejecting the grace of God where Jesus fulfilled the law, you're saying, don't worry, God, I've got this. I could take care of this. I could do this on my own. Well, by saying that, you're saying that his sacrifice on the cross is of no profit to you whatsoever. And that means you're okay to, returning to, the, to return to the bondage of the law. And as a result from the, of that, Paul says, one of the scariest things of all, you've fallen for grace. And it doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. That's not what Paul's saying. It means that you're choosing to rely on your works rather than the grace of God. Yours and my good works, our righteousness, is, as the Bible tells us, filthy rags. That's what they are, filthy rags. They amount to absolutely nothing. And Paul tells us what happens to our works when we stand before Jesus at the beam of seat of God. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So your good works, my good works, any of those works that have been done in the flesh, any of those works that have been done with a wrong motive, and by the way, doing them just to obey the law is a wrong motive. They're going to burn up. They're going to burn up. Those are the works characterized by the wood, hay, and stubble. When they, once they hit the refiner's fire, they're going to burn up. But the works done through the Spirit, those works done as a result of being saved by grace, will be the precious stones that will survive the refiner's fire. Not to say that those who produce works of good wood, hay, and stubble are not going into heaven. They are. They're just going to go into heaven with the smell of smoke on them. You know, I often wonder how many of my works are going to burn up and how many are going to survive as precious stones. Verse 5 of chapter 5. For through the spirit of faith we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith working through love. So here's another consequence of returning to the law. The law requires our outward participation, right? Legalism attempts to control the flesh through rules, laws, and regulations. But the flesh winds up eventually rebelling against those rules, laws, and regulations, doesn't it? However, freedom through the grace of God enables us as surrendered Christians to rely on the Holy Spirit. It is through the Holy Spirit that we resist rebelling against the law that's already been fulfilled in us. Listen, legalism in the law depends on the flesh. Grace relies on the Holy Spirit. The Judaizers were attempting to achieve righteousness, to tell you you could achieve righteousness through the works of the law. Faith is telling us that it's only by the grace of God, through our faith, that we are justified, that we're made right with God, because it's not based on anything we do. It's a gift of God. So we have the righteousness of Jesus imputed to us, but our hope is that one day, when this, when this process of sanctification is ended, we are standing before our Lord glorified, complete in our righteousness. Now Paul lists some characteristics of what the godly life of a believer is. First, faith. Faith rather than works. Faith is at the very core of our Christianity. But faith isn't a word that's easy to, to definitively des describe. The best word that I think describes faith is trust. We place our trust in God. We trust Him for His work on the cross. We trust God for our salvation. Meaning we trust God in everything. The storms and the calm. No matter what circumstances we face in this life, we trust God. Second, the life of a believer is led by the Spirit. A believer is led by the Spirit as opposed to being led by our flesh. And there's a couple ways of, being tell, of telling whether or not you're being led by the Spirit. First, 
The Spirit's never going to lead you away from the Word. He's never going to counsel you anything that goes against the Word of God. Second, there should be signs of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. As we grow and mature, those signs should become more evident. And third, there's conviction when the Holy Spirit's in your life. There's conviction for our sin, not condemnation, conviction that leads us to confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9. And third, waiting in hope. Well, third point, I'm off of that. So the other point that Paul makes as a consequence of, of works by, and as a grace, rejecting grace and, and using works as a works-based faith is waiting in hope. Believers patiently wait in hope rather than worrying about whether we've done enough good works to be saved. The Christian walk really is a dichotomy, right? It's, it's like when I worked on the railroad, it was always hurry up and wait, right? <laughs> hurry up, get out there so you could sit and wait for the signal, which happens three hours from now. The Christian walk is a dichotomy as well. It's wait for our blessed hope, but at the same time, we, we are told to go out into the world. So it's waiting and acting at the same time, right? We're to go into the world. We're to be a witness for Jesus and as to what Jesus has done in our lives. And we are to wait for our blessed hope for the return of our Savior to take his church out of this place. And we can't do any of that in the flesh. That's why first and foremost, the, the, part, the most important part of the Christian life is a spirit-led life. Take, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount. It isn't, as some believe, a road map to help find Jesus. Jesus isn't lost, and he's not that hard to find. The Sermon on the Mount is a description of how we as disciples are to live our lives for Jesus Christ. And it's impossible to live our lives like that without the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Living like that not only requires our outward performance, being doers of the word, not just hearers only, but it also requires an inward change, a new heart, a new life, a new mind. And that can only happen through the Holy Spirit who produces the fruit of righteousness, the newness of life, a change of heart, and a renewed mind in us. Amen? Amen. Paul wrote to the Colossians that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. Listen, we've all tried to live out our faith in our flesh. We've all tried it. Thinking we could control our flesh and thereby control our behavior, right? That's never worked out very well for me. Just saying. The control of our flesh needs to come from within. By divine intervention. And that means we have to surrender to the control of the Holy Spirit and stop quenching the work of the Holy Spirit that he's trying to do through our lives. So based on what Paul writes here, the differences are clear between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. Through the Spirit, I can love others. Through the Spirit, I can live my life for Jesus. Through the Spirit, I can glorify God by my actions. Through the Spirit, I can obey the truth and stand firm in my freedom. Through the Spirit, I can run this race and finish it well. And through the Spirit, I have confidence in Jesus Christ. But in the flesh, in the flesh, I love myself. I live for myself. I glorify my own flesh. The truth is subjective. It's what I believe it is in the flesh. In the flesh, I run this race for believing that whoever has the most material possessions at the end wins. In the flesh, I only have confidence in my ability. So whether, Paul says, whether you're circumcised, which is a sign of the flesh, or not, it doesn't matter. What matters is your heart. Has your heart been circumcised? What matters, are you walking in the spirit or walking in the flesh? That's what matters. Verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? You know, the saddest consequence of going back to a workspace faith is that you may not hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what every Christian wants to hear. Paul, at the end of his life, said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but all, also all who have loved his appearing. 
The Galatians were running this race well. And sometimes the Bible describes our Christian walk as a race, right? But they put the brakes on at some point. They decided the, that they were considering following the law. They were considering going with a works-based faith. They began well. But listen, anybody who's ever run a race, that would not be me. If you see me running, by the way, run, because something bad's coming. And uh, <laughs> Anybody who's ever run a race knows that starting the race is important, but what's most important is how you finish it. You know, I was watching a funny video the other day, and there's a guy in a lane. Any, anybody familiar with how races run? You know, it's on a track that runs around a football field, and you have starting blocks. And so the judge is standing there with his starting pistol, and every time he goes to shoot it, the guy in the very first lane covers his ears. So the judge stops, tells the guy to uncover his ears, get back in the blocks, and this goes on for a couple times. And finally, he takes this guy of the, uh, the lane closest to him and moves him all the way to the furthest lane, right? Well, in the meantime, the guy who's painting the rest of the lines for the lanes painted the first lane straight, but all the rest of the lanes he started getting off track. He veered off and went right off the track into the grass of the football field. So when the judge finally blew the starting, shot the starting pistol, the guys in the nearest lanes ran off into the field, but the guy he moved to the furthest lane ran straight and run the race because he was in the right, right, in the right lane, right? That's what happened to the Galatians. They started out with the truth. They began running the race in their lane, and then somewhere along the line they veered off. We're supposed to walk this walk without veering to the right or to the left. At some point, they veered off the track and wound up in the grass. They began this race in truth, but veered from the truth. And by truth, I believe Paul is referring to the truth of the gospel and the truth by which we live our lives as believers. They'd gone against the truth. They'd gone against the way we are to live our life as believers. They went against the truth of the gospel, which prevented unsaved people from coming to Christ. And when you go against the truth of the way we live our life as Christians, you prevent other or you prevent yourself from living a life in the fullness of Jesus Christ. And in the days in which we live, it's so important to know what we believe and who we believe in. But it's just as important to live our lives according to that truth. Because there's a great falling away that's coming. No, I, Listen, it's not coming. It's already here. It's just going to get worse as time goes on. Paul writes to Timothy, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart by the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, though the insanity of the liars whose consciences are seared, through the insanity of the, the liars whose consciences are seared. We're already seeing that departure. Which means we're what? If Paul says this is going to happen in the latter days and we're already seeing it now, what does that mean? We're in the latter days. We're in the latter days. Do you think those churches I mentioned at the beginning of this message would fit this description? The more the church falls away from the truth, the more the, consciousness, the conscience of those who are attending that church is going to be seared. And they're going to be to the point where they won't be able to return to the truth because their conscience has been so seared by the lies. Paul also writes, he says, they will always be learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. How scary is that? Verses 8 through 10. The persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will be will bear the penalty whoever he is who led you whoever paul's saying whoever led you away from the truth whoever led you down this path whoever caused you to veer off the 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 lane that you were in wasn't sent by god because legalism is never from god notice paul's giving us a way here to spot false teachers one they hinder the truth from going forth False teachers teach another gospel. They preach a different Jesus. But the only way to discern that, the only way to determine who's a false teacher and who's not, is to know your word. Second, they're ungodly, meaning their message isn't from God. 
False teachers like the Judaizers want you to believe that they've been given a special revelation from God. But what they're spewing out is their twisted view of Scripture. Third, they are the leaven that contaminates the church. A little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Just a little bit of sin, a little bit of falsehood, a little bit of false teaching in the church contaminates the entire church. Because what, they, what they're teaching is false. It's not from God. And, and when they teach that, they tend to contaminate everyone who listens to it. But Paul has confidence. He has confidence in the believers in Galatia that they're not going to fall for these false teachings. And he also prays that those who are trying to get them to turn to legalism will face the consequences of what they're doing. Look at verse 11. And the consequence isn't very pretty. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. So Paul makes a strong argument here. The Judaizers are accusing Paul of preaching circumcision, right? And so he says, if I was doing that, why are they still persecuting me? And, and this false claim they're making against Paul may very well be because of he, he had Timothy get circumcised. Do you remember that story in Acts chapter 16? Now, he, he asked Timothy to be circumcised, not to save Timothy. Timothy was already saved. But he asked him to do it so that he wouldn't be a stumbling block to the Jews that they were going to witness to. Listen, we have freedom in Christ, right? We have freedom to do a lot of things. We have freedom to do whatever you want. But you don't always have the right to do it. We have guidelines. And, and one of those guidelines is, will it stumble a brother or sister? Paul would write to the Romans, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. He wrote to the Corinthians, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. So we have freedom. But we don't have freedom to stumble a brother or sister. Take drinking, for instance. I have the freedom to drink a glass of wine. I have that freedom. But I don't have that freedom if I'm in a group of people and I don't know who that might stumble. You see the difference? So the next time you're going to do anything that might stumble a brother or sister, especially, especially in the way that we live our life for Jesus Christ, think about who may be stumbled by your actions because there's always somebody watching. And I don't want you to miss the last part of that passage of Scripture. He says, I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. So Paul's showing a little righteous anger here, which makes, always made me believe that Paul was from Jersey. He got to Rome by way of Jersey. He wishes those who are leading the Galatians astray that they would not only be circumcised, but they would have their manhood removed. Hmm. Don't ever let Paul offer you circumcision. Look at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love the Lord, your, love, the neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Again, we have freedom in Jesus. But instead of using our op freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, we're to use it as an opportunity to serve and love others. And that's the most notable attribute of a believer, is our love for one another. That's how the Bible tells us that we know we are believers, right? They'll know you by your love for one another. But we do tend to beat each other up, don't we? We do like to devour one another. You know, I listen to some podcast Christians, pastors, some of them, that are so critical, I pray that you never listen to any of the messages of this church. Because let's be honest, you can sit here, you can sit in any church and pick it apart. You can pull apart everything that goes on during service. You can pull apart everything a pastor says. Is that loving? You know, one of the guys at the Bible study reminded me yesterday of something Jesus said. If they're not against us, they're for us. Every pastor, every church that does things a little differently than the way we do isn't always against Jesus and his word. No doubt some are. 
Many are, and they seem to be growing today. Some are against us, like the church I mentioned earlier, right? And some pastors outwardly teach another gospel, like the woke social gospel. Some preach another Jesus, like the ones that preach that Jesus is the spirit brother of, of Lucifer. Some teach there's no re need for repentance, that you could be saved and go on living your life in sin. That's actually taught today. So, no, they're not with us or for us. They are against us. And, yes, I'm going to say this again. They make it comfortable for a goat to stay a goat. Those teachers are clearly against us. So we need to pray for discernment as to who's against us and who's for us, right? Listen, if they point you to Jesus, and I mean the Jesus of the Bible, not a Jesus that they invented, but they point you to the Jesus of the Bible, and that they tell you that salvation is in him and him only, then they're for us. If they preach forgiveness for sins by admitting that we are sinners and we need repentance, they are for us. Now, I know we talk a lot about false teachers here. Now, it's not to say that we're perfect, because we're not. And it isn't a plan to build this church up by tearing down other pastors and churches. That's not the incentive, because that would not be loving. But it would also not be loving to not talk about deception, which is something Jesus warned us about would be prevalent in the last days. And people are being deceived more and more and more by false teaching. So I want you to be prepared for the deception that's already here and grow stronger week by week. And I also want us to be loving, to pray, because that is an act of love also, isn't it? To pray for those who are false teachers. To pray that the scales would fall from their eyes. To pray that they would turn from what they're doing. And to pray for those who are sitting there listening to this and being deceived by it. I always want to do the most loving thing that I can do toward any lost goat that wanders into the sheep pen. And that's to share the gospel message with them. So that as I was a lost goat wandering into a sheep pen, I'm just going to beat this to death. And that Pastor Lloyd did for me so many years ago. He shared the gospel. He opened his Bible and read the word of God. And that's what transformed me from a lost goat to a sheep. So if you're here today and you're not one of his, Forget the reference I made to a goat. But if you're not his sheep, to become his sheep is as easy as ABC. Admit you're a sinner. That's where it all starts. You have to admit that we're sinners. Because unless you admit you're a sinner, what do you need to be saved from? The Bible says, I didn't say this, the Bible says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we have a sin problem. But God took care of that. He sent his only begotten son to die for our sin so that we could be forgiven, that we could be washed clean. But that also requires repentance on our part. You know, I was reading a, uh, a salvation message in a book that one of these pastors wrote, um, who's not with us, by the way, not for us. And... Um, as you read through it, it, it looks great. The whole thing looks great. And he gets to the point where he says, and we are saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now he mentions sin in there. And if you were to read this, if this was on their, their website, you'd think there's nothing wrong with it. The most glaring mistake in that statement, in that, in that verse, in that passage of what he said was, there's no repentance needed. That's the most glaring thing there. There's no repentance needed. And there's so many churches that teach that today. If there's no repentance needed after you're saved, then why did God, why did the Holy Spirit put 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible? If we confess our sins, isn't that, we're, we're, we're confessing it, and we're faithful and just, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Aren't we going to God confessing our sin and repenting of it? How many times does the Bible tell us we need to repent? That was Jesus' whole message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So how can we now teach there's no repentance after you're saved? So you need to repent from that sin. Turn to Jesus. And then you will be forgiven of your sin and washed clean by his blood. 
And that requires us to be, believe, believe that Jesus died for our sin, that he's coming back in glory to judge the living and the dead. You know, we forget that part. We forget that part. We forget that all of us one day, believers and non-believers, are going to stand before Jesus. Believers at the Bema seat, non-believers at the great white throne judgment. We're all going to give an account. Our accounts could be a little different than the guy standing at the great white throne judgment. I think that's a little quicker than ours. You know, the Bible says there's no tears in heaven, right? But that verse comes after the new heaven and the new earth. I think there's going to be a lot of tears at that beam of sea judgment. When God shows us just how mightily he could have used us if we were just a little bit more obedient. C, confess that you're a sinner. Confess that you can't do this on your, on your own. Call upon the name of the Lord. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 